It is a great honor and a privilege to introduce Eva Hammelberger. Your maiden name was Bia. And Eva, you are one of the very few that were saved on the, the boats that went Great. from Denmark to, to Sweden. Yeah, yeah. And we're here in your beautiful apartment in Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem. And I'm so my grateful mes- to you. What you mean my, uh, one of my, uh, one of my grand hosts said about another apartment, we, 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 she was in in, Kuben, in in Manchester, that it was a mixture of a museum and shukha pishpishim, that's how I described it. And I have a talent to make everything attached look like shukha pishpishim. It's a wonderful apartment you have. But Eva, thank you so much for, for letting me hear about your story and your incredible family that actually originally came yeah, from Yeah, I, I think it's... Um, okay, you want to know about my family, so I'll start with my parents. Both of them were born in Frankfurt am Main, in, both of them in August 91. My father on the 5th of August, my, fa- my mother on the 16th. And we always said that those 11 days made all the difference because he was very much part of familias and, and quite dominant and, and domineering. And my mother appeared to be dominated, but there was this core of iron in her which became m- more apparent the older she got. My father got milder, and my mother got uh, more, shall we say, assertive. So, um, my mother knew about my father's family. They both belonged to uh, Samson Raphael Hirsch's Austrittsgemeinde, which was the special um, uh, community he founded because the general community in Frankfurt at the time wasn't to his liking, wasn't sufficiently religious and actually my, one of my grandfathers joined the same day as Samson Raphael Hirsch and the other, a few, it's documented, the other one who was called Emil Isaac uh, joined a few months later. So my mother knew about my father's family because there were these young boys and she said we knew those family, that family, their, their children had zehn nach zehn füße, which means if you look at the clock they walked with their feet out. So she saw them tripping down the uh, uh, street like that. They lived very close. My, they didn't really know each other, but I showed you, first of all, this picture. You can show this is a very yeah, special picture. Which has a, yeah, okay, it has a special story. A bit of a long story, but nice. Are you, yeah? My, my mother was very popular. Uh, she was a very pretty, popular, a uh, girl of probably six, 17 and the girls of her class came and said uh, would you join a dance class this is from Frankfurt am Main but the dance class she went and asked her father who said no you can't so uh, she went back to the girls and said no my father won't let me and then the bo- girls came back to her and said, but Alice, she was called Aziz Isaac, if you don't join, Erich Beer won't join. And if Erich Beer doesn't join, none of the boys will join. So it all depends on you. She went back and made another plea to her um, father who gave in. And here's a picture of the Purim ball of the dance class and my father has already he is putting a hand on the shoulder of my mother to say she belongs to me um, that's my father in the police uniform and that's his hand on her shoulder okay can you 
Can you see what I am pointing at? But meanwhile, there was a very good friend, friend of his, this guy with the, it's called, uh, the ears are called like coffee cup, uh, what you call handles, because his ears stick out like that. He was a very close friend of my father. And eventually my father went with his family and they went to work in a firm, in, in, in the family firm in um, Berlin. And my mother remained in Frankfurt and had a hard time because her mother was ill and she and her sister looked after her for four years and the guy Herbert Kuskal uh, who I met uh, several times uh, got engaged to my mother uh, and my, my father sent them a lovely uh, picture something uh, uh, and but he said if Alice marries Herbert she is not the Alice that I know he didn't do anything about it and uh, my mother uh, was terribly fond of Herbert but not f f when it came to marrying purpose she realized he wasn't for her and she broke off the engagement and uh, that was that and I have here in in my bedroom a box with a letter from a friend of my father's from it must be 1925 20 no from 1927 probably where he says you know you always wanted Alice and she's available now and Herbert would not have been the right her husband for her why don't you go for it and apparently my father took his advice and got in touch with my mother and they corresponded and my mother who was not quite as decisive as my father couldn't make up her mind and apparently he got fed up with her ya nine ya nine and said look I won't I won't be in touch at all if if you want to you be in touch and uh, she lasted six weeks with no communication she sent him a postcard which I also have no car no card no letter no nothing with a girl with tears he was steadfast stood his ground and she caved in and they got engaged and married in no time at all because the parents were obviously were scared that she would do a repeat and uh, uh, so they married and uh, she they had quite a turbulent uh, marriage uh, and I personally became a marriage counselor because uh, somebody said to me, why have you chosen such a difficult, uh, 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 such a <laughs> difficult job? And I said, because it's the one I am best qualified to. I've been working since I was six years old, which was true, you know. They, but they were both very charming and loved each other but when we grew up there was plenty of bangs of doors and uh, si uh, horrible silences and yet it was for me a very cheerful happy family home so they lived they got married in Frankfurt they lived in Berlin they got married in 27 and they lived in Berlin and uh, uh, they were what I would call jeunesse dorée. You know, my my father was a partner in the family firm. I always had a Mercedes with a chauffeur waiting for him outside if he had to go to work. He was their firm was the second biggest estate agency in 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 Berlin, and my mother 
was uh, materially very spoiled, but uh, had uh, a lovely natural uh, way of coping with things. Um, so they married, as I said, in in uh, 27, 11th of September. When 11th of September came in New York, I thought, hmm, there was a forerunner to that. <laughs> anyway. Eva, do you know who the rabbi was who married your Sorry? parents? Sorry? Do you know who the rabbi was who married your parents? No, my parents, I don't know. My grandparents, my mother's parents, were uh, given Chupa and Kedusha by Samson Raphael Hirsch, who under the Chupa said to my grandfather, Mordechai war ein Jude, was a Jew and was a minister. Why will you, why, I knew you not uh, a Jew, because my grandmother wasn't going to wear a, a scheidel upon which she clapped on the scheidel and wore that. Uh, they were they were religious, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't at all common in those days, yeah. uh, even for religious women to cover their hair. Anyway, uh, getting back, we have a picture of your father when he was. This is my father, as a young kid. And that was from Frankfurt, it was taken in Frankfurt. And you have also your father's report. Oh, that's my father's report book from, uh, also it's the Samson Raphael School uh, in Germany. And my father had very little respect for uh, formal uh, teaching. Oh, this is my father's uh, grandfather, my great-grandfather, Max Hackenbach. On the, n not on the beer side, on his mother's side. Anyway, I wanted to point out that my father had little respect for formal teaching, which probably came from the fact that he got special treatment because his father was an executive and his sense of justice at school rebelled about that. He left, he was not impressed with his teacher and left school at the age of 14, which was of course very young, but was totally self-taught, knew many languages, uh, became his real calling was being an expert uh, on art and many uh, museum directors consulted him in Copenhagen uh, when I was a child. He was well known to the <laughs> our dinner times in, in Copenhagen depended on when the uh, museums closed and opened. Shabbos lunch was 12.30 because after school, he could nip into the library of the academy and spend an hour there before coming home for lunch. So we knew that was, but we had to finish lunch quick, pretty quickly because he, then he went to the library on Shabbos, uh, which was right, very nearby, of the Museum of Decorative Arts, and they closed at four. So by 2.30 we had to a bench and be out, he had to be out and Tuesday everything was governed by when the oh the, the big museum of art there I don't know a special department for 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 special drawings that museum closed at one so that that department closed at one so lunch on Sundays was one one thirty <laughs> so and so Everything was governed by partially Judaism and partially museums. Um, Can I ask, why did your parents move from Germany to... They, to <laughs> why? A very good question. Hitler came. They, he, Hitler came to power the 1st of January, uh, 33, and the 1st of April, 33, there was going to be a huge raid, like um, 
uh, Razzia it was called, similar to Kristallnacht, when Jews were arrested and, and, and so on. And although my parents were Orthodox, they, this was looming and they left the Friday night, they left on the train, took, they had a huge apartment uh, with maids and I don't know what, took two suitcases, their two little boys who had been born, 29 and 30. This is a uh, picture of your mother, I think, with the two boys? Yeah, that's my mother with my older brothers, born respectively 29 and 30. And what were your brothers' names? Sorry? What were the names of your brothers? Uh, the older one was called Robert and the younger one was Rudy. Here's another picture of your Yeah. Mom. And this picture is still in, in, in Germany? Uh, this is Robert. They were very close in age. He was born uh, on my father's birthday, 5th of August, uh, uh, 29, and my this brother was born 30th of uh, September, uh, 30. Anyway, so they just took that like, two s children, two suitcases, and left like that, left everything, uh, and went to Copenhagen, where eventually the four of them were in. Uh, they they didn't couldn't take much money or anything with them, uh, and they were in a boarding house. Uh, the four of them, and my mother would stand. She had never cooked in her life, and she would stand in the corner. They, of course, they kept kosher, so they couldn't eat. Uh, uh, they, they might have had vegetarian in the boarding house, but anything meaty she would have to cook in the little corner of this room where the four of them slept. And my father, who was of a sarcastic uh, turn, came in from town, saw my mother with a cookery book and stirring the pot and said, I sterbe noch an einen Druckfehler, which translate into one day I'll die from a printing mistake. So that was that. And my older brother said, Mommy, in Berlin, we slept in a bedroom, we played in a playroom, we ate in a dining room, and you weren't there at all, because till then the maids took care of the children. So it was a huge transformation from a, a, luxury, a life of jeunesse dorée, of golden youth in Berlin, to poor refugees in, in, in Copenhagen. And I always personally admired my parents for not having any regrets, just being grateful about, you know, uh, the fact that they got away, that they survived the Hitler and the Nazi era, and uh, taking everything totally in their stride. And okay, so. This is my uncle Ludwig, who lived in Brussels. This is my auntie Pauline. Uh, I could say, I want actually to tell you a story. He was a very devoted son and went out from Germany with his father, who carried at a time where it was forbidden to take silver or anything out, who carried his Sefer Torah with all the silver and all the ornaments um, out, very visibly for all to see. And the Nazi um, uh, functionary said to, said to my grandfather, who was accompanied by this uncle, Gute Reise, Herr Isaac. The next one is Pauline, who uh, lived in New York and who was a lady, 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 horrific lady, and, and, and spent five days in a cattle wagon during the war. 
Next one is Carl, who lived in Stockholm. Uh, next is my mother, who I'm talking about. And this is my uncle, my mother's youngest un uh, brother, um, Otto, who lived in Copenhagen. Uh, so, and in between those two, there was a brother, Julius, who was murdered in Auschwitz, and in between my mother and this one, there was a sister who died in a concentration, uh, after having been in Gours, a concentration sh a camp in France. And these are the five surviving siblings who met in Copenhagen in 47. So, your, can I ask, did your parents go to Copenhagen because your mother had a brother? Probably, possibly, uh, possibly, but it was also, uh, Denmark was the nearest, um, they lived in Berlin, so from Berlin to Copenhagen was just a hop, and possibly at that time they thought that the Hitler era will blow over and they'll be able to return. I'm not sure, I don't think that when they, the minute they just up and left, that they thought that they would never return to Germany. But this is, this was the nearest country to go to. Did anybody else from the family join them? Um, well, uh, my, my, uh, my, both my paternal grandfather came to visit, but he went back to the uncle who was in Brussels and who was this dandy gentleman, this one. Uh, and eventually my, this uncle and my, and his wife and his four-year-old son, I've also got pictures of them, walked for days to get to France from Belgium and uh, I should show you the picture of my glamorous, uh, the daughter of this one was with them and my auntie by marriage said, I can't walk anymore, I can't leave me with a pram and, and this 14 year old girl said, come on, you can walk and carry it on. And Lisa, I've got a beautiful picture of her, the daughter of this one, they came they ended up in, in, in Lisbon and there was a huge queue to get into the embassy but um, this pretty cheeky daughter of hers saw that there was a back entrance and went to the back entrance and charmed the uh, consul in Lisbon so that he, they got on the last boat to uh, America. You want the picture? One second. So this is the daughter that uh, who 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 got who went and the, the back the back the kitchen chairs to the consul found the consulate and charmed him so much that he let her and the mother go on the last boat to New York. But they had by that time. The mother, she must have had money. She went to Gours and uh, bribed the uh, the people there, gave them money, and they let out the charming uncle and here and and his father, my grandfather, and my grandfather's actually buried in Perpignan, uh, south of France, and. Uh, Henny uh, was also died there, another sister of my mother's. Okay, you've got it? Okay. I jump around, but in a way I wanted to come back to you and say and tell you about my father's contempt for formal education. Uh, one of the same, he ended up having five children out of whom I'm the force, and he always said, my main aim with my children is they should never be top of the class. 
And I once wrote the essay, quoted him and said, we've all been very good children and listened to my father. No, <laughs> nobody ever did, came top of top. But he was totally erudite and, and, and uh, a very big, uh, you, if you want This is you, a beautiful picture of, maybe you, you in it as well. Well, um, this is just, we look, it's saying in 1942, I will have been six months, I'm the baby, and I will have been about uh, six months in. Okay. And maybe to illustrate my father's art thing, you could show the. So you could take a picture of if you want. Uh, I'm not, I'm easy. I mean, I, don't, I know what it looked like. I was so born. This is, this is the I was born in this flat. I was born. Uh, this is your home in in, in oh, Copenhagen. Yeah. Wow, it's a beautiful. You can see the beautiful art. If you look here. Look up, look up there. That's the candela. It was, it's from the Chabrakadische in, I forget where, in Poland, gave this to the community, that candelabra. It's it got Hebrew inscription. <laughs> and you have it in your home? really special <coughs> and <coughs> if you have it what a beautiful painting as well my my nephew who was a photographer took these pictures straight after my father had died because it was only a rented flat so all yeah. the rest of the flat was al hapanim. <laughs> it was very old fashioned and so difficult. How did your, your your parents came to Copenhagen? Yes. And they couldn't really take much money out of Germany? No, but my mother um, was from a very well to do family and she had part of her Ndunia, part of her, I don't know what you call, dowry was in America so slowly f my father had no work permit for five years so for five years there was no money coming in and they must have lived very very uh, frugally on, 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 probably on my mother's dowry uh, which was sent somehow to, to, to Denmark he got he came to he, they came to Denmark uh, in in uh, April '33, uh, and he didn't get his work permit till five years later. At which point, my sister Ruth had been born, and they had to leave the boarding house where the four of them were were uh, staying, and he had to. <laughs> This is so crazy. He had to look for a uh, he had to look for a flat that would accommodate his library, which there was a door behind there, and there was a door on the other side. Here, this is a continuation. But he made a door in between so that his library could be accommodated, and this was the the pillars came from some Frigi something, some some king's palace, which was for sale in an antique shop. So he bought the the pillars and just had shelves made that accommodated the same on the other side. So apart from being poor refugees, he had to look for a flat which had a six meter long wall to accommodate the library. Anyway. You can see your father was a very distinguished 
Oh yeah. I've actually got that picture. This picture is hanging over there. Yeah. And then what type of work did your father do when he got his work filled? My, what did my father do? He was, he was in, um, he, he was in state a, agent, you can't, he dealt with developments or, 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 or um, house, not small houses. In, in Germany, he was in charge of the villa department of the estate agency. And as I told you, he sold, he sold Albert Einstein. He, Albert Einstein was one of his customers. But in Denmark, <laughs> there were no Albert Einstein. So he, whilst he was unemployed, he used to take the tram to the end of the station, wherever it was, and walk back from wherever it was so that he got to know the geography of Copenhagen very well. So once he started working, he had a very good knowledge of what was a good area, etc. And do, you, do you know the name of the real estate company in Germany? Yes, of course, it was Beer. It was Judis M. Beer. It's my maiden name. A beer. Julius M. Beer was the man who started it, and even in Jerusalem, the I don't know if they still are. There was, there were branches in Munich and in Berlin and in Frankfurt, all over the place. Are they still branches today? I, in my time, uh, one of my uh, sort of not close relations definitely had a estate agency here in Jerusalem. He lived. The man who had it lived at the end of this road. I knew him. And I'm not sure, uh, there's a silversmith beer here. Uh, he died, Yitzhak beer, but his, his very well-known uh, silversmith does lovely things, of which I have many uh, bits, not, not a lot, but quite a few bits. But his brother, carried on being an estate agent here. And in Germany today, is there still... In Germany, I'm sure nothing, because everybody left. I mean, nobody, there's... Mm, uh, the war uh, saw to it that nobody uh, stayed in Germany. But I had, I had three uncles and a grandmother, my only, the only grand parent I knew was my grand, my paternal grandmother. They all went to uh, that little, yeah. Her maiden name was Hackenbrock. That is your paternal grandmother? Huh? Your paternal grandmother? That is my grandmother, yeah, my father's mother. And what happened to her? Huh? What happened to her? Well, she lived a long life. Uh, her husband had died in 1934. Uh, they left German. They they left Germany with my youngest, uh, with my father's youngest brother, my grandfather, grandmother, and my father had a young a brother uh, who died. In, about three, four years ago, at the age of 104, <laughs> and he was a character. I, I'll just digress and tell you about my uncle. At 70, his daughter made a birthday party for him, and we stood outside, this is in London, we stood outside the garden, and he said to me in a very funeral voice, it won't be long now. And when he was a hundred, I, I rang him up from wherever I was here in Israel and said, Uncle Irvin, I know you don't like phone calls early in the morning, but you've been threatening me with your imminent demise for the last 30 years. So in case something happens later on in the day, I want to catch you in the morning, you know. Sure. <laughs> but he lived, bless him till 104 and loved Switzerland and the mountains and 
He was well over 100 when he went with two carers twice in the summer to Switzerland. Okay, but I digress, but that was him. Uh, so, um, so my grandmother came to London where she had three sons and lived and died a natural death just before her 90th birthday. And she used to go for a walk. She was a, a bit of a character. She used to go for a walk in the crematorium in, in Go the Screen because it had a beautiful garden. And people said, Charlotte, how can you go there? And she said, they don't keep you there. <laughs> and she refused to go on the underground because she said, I'm going to spend such a long time there anyway. I'm not starting that. She had a lovely sense of humor. Wow. So yeah, yeah, yeah. She was, and and a woman said to her, came to her. She lived in the Otto Schiff house uh, in London, very well looked after, and from the age of, I think, probably sixty-five or seventy, we think she had a lady in waiting looking after her. But she was a real lady. Uh, and a woman came to visit her and she said, Mrs. Beer, you must be so lonely. And my grandmother looked at her daggers and said, I'm never lonely when I'm alone. So, so that was my grandmother. Did she come and visit you in Denmark? Sorry? Did she come to Denmark to visit you? Did she come? To Denmark? Very little. I remember her in 47 when I was six. She came, there was a lot of, in 47 for some reason, my parents had a lot of family on both sides who came, but I went to, I, I had the choice when I was 12, either to get a new bike, which I've still never had, or uh, to go on a trip to London, and I chose to go to London, and I went before my 12th birthday because it was cheaper to go while she was still 11. And I went, I was very proud. I traveled on my own for 27 hours uh, by, by train, boat and train. And, and, and my mother was very worried about me, but my father had full confidence that I would manage very well, which I did. So. I suppose, being the child of my parents, I had to learn to become independent very you, early. You went when you were 11? Sorry? You went by yourself at the age of yeah. 11? Yeah. Uh, now, I was just, just before my 12, I was 11 when I went, I was 12 by the time I came back. But I, uh, I, I had no problem, you know, I was, I suppose, I was shy, but I was very confident <laughs> at the time. Uh, okay, so that, but there is a lot in between because we we were basically only got to 38 and the most interesting part is yet to come. So uh, the Nazis came to Copenhagen in four, uh, 40, 9th of April 40, they invaded Copenhagen and uh, for three years uh, there was no persecution of the, the Danish government came to some kind of accommodation um, with the Germans so that they could be independent of uh, there was not German rule but resistance became worse and worse in August uh, 43, I believe that there was a lot of uh, uh, sabotage, so the Germans got fed up and started imposing much more on on the government, including persecution of Jews, and two big uh, transport boats were in Copenhagen Harbor, ready to take the Jews and transport them to Theresienstadt. But there was a, uh, this is history, I'm just telling you general history, there was a, a naval Nazi officer called Dukwitz who 
So this is not a good idea. There'll be a lot of trouble if we start persecuting the Jews. I don't know whether he was a Jew lover or was just pragmatic. And he went to the uh, to the then, I think, prime minister called Hiltoft, who then went to the head of the Jewish um, community called uh, C.B. Henrikus and told them that this was about to happen. And it was announced. There were a few days of not knowing what was happening, but Air of Rosh Hashanah, 43, anybody who came to shul was told that there won't be any uh, tefillah now, there won't be any prayers. Go home and leave your houses straight away. Don't tell everybody not to be at home because the Nazis had broken into the uh, offices of the Jewish community and taken the list of Jewish, uh, uh, all the names and addresses. So at that time, my little brother was five months old. I was two years and a bit. My sister Ruth was seven and the older boys were uh, 14 and 13. Uh, just about, my second brother was just about to be Momitra. And Air of Rosh Hashanah, my, my parents just had to flee. So my sister has described, how, I don't remember this at all, of course, has described how my mother made her put uh, like f four layers of clothing on. You couldn't take a suitcase or anything. And, and she felt like a, uh, like a doll that has been puffed up. She could hardly walk with all that clothes. And where would they go? So my father, by that time, had a very established... Uh, he had established himself very successfully as an estate agent. And one of his clients was um, one of the directors of the then biggest uh, department store called Ilom. It's still there. And he went to this guy uh, and said he had seen an envelope on his uh, desk saying, Mr. Estate Owner. So he went, he thought he had an estate. And he went to him and said, look, we're Jews, we have to flee. Could you take, could we go and hide in a barn? And the guy said, just one second, I just have to check with my wife. Picked up the phone, said, uh, Esther, can we take seven people? And she said, yes. And uh, that day, in drips and drops, they got to the address, which was not an estate at all, it was just an ordinary suburban house. They had three teenage daughters who they had to send out of the house and they took us in just like that uh, and I've got if you want to stop a moment I've got a picture uh, so this is a picture of your father's birthday birthday table with my oldest brother born on the same day as my father this as a birthday in, birth. and what what is the date sorry and the date uh, 5th of August 1930. And even the other pictures that we have? Let me just see what, uh, what might be of interest. Well, uh, they're sweet pictures, but let me just show you, find the one that I want to show you. You may be interested this is a picture of us returning, it was in the newspaper, returning from Sweden after the war. And where are you in the picture? Here. And my little brother, as always, is trying to grab something off me. Nothing has changed. So you're on the, the left. And it's, wow, that's amazing. And this was in the, the Danish... Uh, Sorry? This was in the papers, in the Danish newspapers. Yeah. And these are the people who saved us.
those two. And their names? I'll sing. It's remarkable. <coughs> and there's a picture of Ruth with... Yes, that's a picture of Ruth with the daughter. And this guy, uh, I was two when I got there, and as you can see, he's, this is at the time, he was bald. And apparently he fell in love with me because he said, Eva, you've got such lovely curls. And he was bald, and sa I said to him, so have you, Paul. <laughs> and he fell in love, and I must tell you, I loved him and he loved me. He died high in his 90s and I I was totally in the... I, I, I really loved that man. Did your families keep in touch? Yes, we kept in touch. I, I lived in Israel by then and I kept in touch with him. He was a stamp collector and I used to uh, send him all the first editions. Um, this is another sister. It's not after the war. This is this has, this picture. It's not true that it's after the war. This must have been taken when I I was two and Ruth was seven. Here, this one here with one of the daughters. This one here. Wonderful. We kept in touch forever, till they died. This is my, this is the grandfather who was quite imposing in Copenhagen, visiting, uh, and that's the grandfather, this one who carried, I'll see if there's a better picture of him, um, no, um, who carried the Safer Tower. Maybe that isn't. I've got other places. Okay. This is the grandfather, the maternal grandfather. This one here. Oh, that's wonderful. And the above, it's a picture of your. This is Ru my two brothers and Ruth and that's me as a baby. Uh, I'm, you can't see, I'm just a baby here, there. Uh, let me see. Anyway. Oh, yeah. oh it's coming to bits, this book. Anyway. So, so, uh, my parents, I'm coming back to that era of Rosh Hashanah, so my mother packed dodo in the pram high up with nappies and soap and whatever she could think of taking, and the challah she had just baked, and, and uh, some meat she had baked, uh, she had cooked and took it all to these people. And they hid us for seven days, and then it became too dangerous for them because all of a sudden, Mrs. Alsing had to buy much more milk and bread and stuff. Uh, so my mother went to a, a very sort of simple place where she had spent the summer uh, with us children. And she could hear the man snoring, you know, and she knocked on the window and said, Mr. Christensen, and she, he woke up and said, Mrs. Beer. You know, uh, and and so my father and mother and two boys hid with them, and I stayed with Ruth and Dodo with the original uh, Alzings, and Erv Yom Kippur, my uh, they found a fishing boat we could go on, and Mr. Alzing took us in a taxi to the harbour where the fishing boat was. It cost 
the fish the fishermen were risking their lives so it cost a lot of money uh, they could risk their livelihood it, it cost I think a thousand kroner a person and the firm that Mr. Alsing worked for they paid for us and Mr. Alsing even came when we were in Sweden and he came to visit us during the war so you know it was a fabulous relationship and Erevion Kippa they uh, all of us were we were the last people a boat that could take 30 people had around 200 on it packed like sardines and uh, we came to Sweden and we were saved and my mother had this one brother as well in Stockholm and he helped my mother it was hard for my mom she she had two really small children and, and a family of five and no money and um, again refugees and my father got the only job as such he ever had he, I told you he was uh, very very erudite with, with the art and he got a job as a curator in the National Museum and uh, during his time there he came there in, in September for or October, I'm not sure whether it must have been October uh, 43 and he stayed till the end of the war which was May 45 and he got a job as a curator and he, he put on an exhibition of old uh, maps of, of, of towns, ancient maps and the then um, Crown Prince wanted to come and see the exhibition and he wanted to come on a Saturday so the people said to him sorry Mr. Beer doesn't work on a Saturday he wanted to be taken around by the curator so even your your father got a job in the as a curator in yeah. yeah he I, I told you he he had he had flair what really interested him, he ha he did whatever he did as a business, uh, not with great enthusiasm. His enthusiasm was art, and he was terribly, terribly um, well educated about it. And uh, he felt a bit uh, sad because he had an uncle on my. Uh, on, on, on his mother's side there was an uncle called Hackenbach who was an art dealer and he would have loved to be apprenticed to him but um, he didn't he got a job with some banking people that he absolutely hated when he was young uh, and eventually he, he went into the family firm where he did very well but his his real interest was art and uh, there was a very well-known guy in Copenhagen, uh, a very uh, amusing uh, guy with great sense of humor and he, he wanted some property and he said, Mr. Beer, maybe in your spare time, maybe you could find me such and such a property because he, he knew all my father's enthusiasm was art, not, not the word. But my father was a very uh, non non greedy uh, businessman. He di he did it because somehow he was also uh, a come. He was very. My mother was very generous. My father was um, very. Uh, how do you call it? Kamtan. What do you call that in English? Uh, he was tight with money. Tight, tight. Terrible. Terrible. It's an illness. I suppose it's stingy. Stingy. He was stingy. Uh, he. I loved him dearly, but he was. He was stingy, and I mean you can see. Uh, uh, it must have cost him a little bit this, but he was very very clever. He would go and find. He found this bit, this thing, in in a box 
dismantled in 20 pieces. That this is the um, yeah. That's amazing, and it's so well, wonderful that it's in your home in Jerusalem. It's well, it's, it's wonderful it's, that it's in it's your from Kovno. It, it's got Kovno. an inscription in Hebrew. It's from Kovno, from the Chevre Kadish in 17 something. I can't do the numbers, Kovno. but even can I just mention? Sorry, can I mention? What happened in Denmark is very unique. Yeah, that, that, that's that, totally that, unique. It's a very bad copy of something my father saw in an antique shop in 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 Copenhagen. He used to go around the antique shops, and he saw this in a bowl with all kinds of other rubbish, and. Uh, he was madly interested. For some reason, he didn't do anything about it that moment. And he went back to the antique dealer where he'd seen it. And he said, you had a blue ceramic something. Uh, uh, where is it? He said, oh, I sold it. And my he didn't say where, who he sold it to. And my father uh, worked out which antique dealer might have been interested in that and went to went to the antique dealer and uh, that he thought might have it and found it and he bought it for a song but he knew that it was something very very special it is a picture of Nefertiti it's Egyptian Nefertiti is holding uh, something of Osiris it's a ancient Egyptian uh, thing but he recognized what it was and bought it for a song and it became uh, he, he, he later on he sold it for a massive amount to the group to take it's called a beautiful art gallery in Copenhagen I mean he had a terrific flair it's a gift Pardon? it's a gift he had a gift yeah it was flair flair and interest and knowledge. Can I make you another coffee? No, no, okay. So Eva, I just want to ask you, because it is, if we can go back to... Sorry? What happened in Denmark, I think there were 7,800 Jews. Seven, Say it again, I'm seven, sorry. Seven, what happened to the 8,000 Jews? 7,800, yeah. and the majority um, were saved and went to Sweden, but there were a, there were a few, a few hundred that actually were not well or couldn't get out. The old they, uh, from the old age home and, they, they and, were taken and to, the to and state. the prime the the, the um, what you call it chief rabbi Friediger he was called he was also taken to Theresienstadt. I think that number was four hundred four hundred and eighty two. Died. No, went to Theresienstadt. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and they were lucky because they got Red Cross parcels and were kept quite well. In a uh, many section. of them would have died anyway of old age, mm -hmm. but most of them came back. I think 50 died in Theresienstadt. But what's amazing, out of the 7,200, I think that went to Sweden. I don't know, even more. I thought 8,000. That's amazing. I've got a book about it. Now, what happened to your home when you left? It stayed. It stayed uh, uh, we had this home was actually in a house which still stands there. It's been stand it was built in seventy fifty two, I think. This, this is the this home that you What? And what when you left? Well I was born I was actually born in that flat. Oh. Uh was Ruse? Mm, yes, Ruse was also born. My sister Ruth, whom you interviewed, was born in the flat, so was I, and so was my younger flat, home birth. Uh, and the flat was in the street that leads up to the King's. We were born in, it's called Amelika uh, number 11. Amelika is the street that leads up to the uh, King's Palace, and the house is still standing there. Uh, my grandchildren have been there, I've took them there. Uh, our, the flat wasn't ours, it, it was given back to the uh, uh, owners, but uh, the house is there. And totally. all, all your father's books and... 
it all stayed there. Nobody, nobody went inside. Or uh, well, let me just see what I can find. Can you see here? If you, this wallpaper here is the color of that. Yeah. Is the color of this? <coughs> they took it from Germany. It's Kitschfa. Um, um, what do you call that? I can't think of the word. Um, the material is Kitschfa. Do you know that in Hebrew? It's uh, velvet. Velvet. Yeah, I couldn't think of it. It's all velvet, and it's the cheapest wallpaper ever. They took it from Germany. Uh, a friend of my mother's packed up the whole flat in 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 uh, Germany and sent the stuff to Denmark, including this must have been I don't know what curtains or something, and we had curtains. Can you see? It's beautiful. Uh, on the side are curtains and the city. There's a city. I don't know if it shows. Yeah. The settee and the wallpaper, it's all that color velvet. And it, it, it was still on the walls, perfect, uh, when, when we sold the flat. But when, when you w w went to when the boat... We, we didn't sell it, when we gave it back. When you went on the boat to, to Sweden... The flat stayed. My, my parents at the time, they, my father had established himself and they had two maids. Uh, who probably stole quite a lot of stuff, but my mother, just before they left, she took most of the silver to a neighbor who had a little um, dairy two doors away, and when they came back, all the silver was standing there, polished beautifully, and a big. She had made a big cake for them as well. And she uh, gave it back. I gave everything back, but my one of the maids, uh, my mother knew where she lived, and she went to her house, and she saw her mother's candlesticks and a special uh, clock that she loved from her mother as well, standing in the uh, windowsill, and she said to the maid. Uh, we've come back from Sweden and very nice of you to look after my things but I'd like to have them back and the maid said you gave them to me and the the, the father of the maid was a policeman my mother just left it didn't want to make it listen it's a small price to pay and the flat was intact it's amazing the people come they rang the bell but they didn't break the doors down if nobody opened that was it. You know, even that is quite amazing because in... Yeah, no, uh, they, you know, yeah, it's... Didn't you You should actually read a little bit uh, about the history of... I've got a big book here. I think it's in English. I would lend it to you. Uh, it's the editor of one of the main... Um, <clears throat> of the main paper in Copenhagen who wrote a special book about what happened uh, if you've time it's, I'll it's, lend it's, it's incredible the story no and I've read it uh, but I mean yeah I'm sure you know the story it's, it's amazing but this is in great deep it's not very I wouldn't say it's the most wonderful book but it does give the the interest of the people he describes is not incredibly interesting but the, he knows a lot about the political uh, background also with the government but what, what is also amazing is that the, the priests sorry all the the, the the population of Denmark the priests yeah. the workers yeah the government they all the students un, they were all the unified they the were students all got time off from university to to, to to help the Jews to escape. Um, the hospitals were full of Jewish refugees under false names. Uh, uh, there's one wonderful story after the other. All of us have stories to tell. The story I told you is very, very nice, but it's not untypical and um, I know my sister told me after after we had left, the neighbor of Mr. Alsing, the man I showed you, 
said, uh, oh, have your juice gone? He said to Mr. Alsing, and Mr. Alsing said, mm. And he said, yes. Yeah. So he sa and then he said, so have mine. Wow. Yeah. That's... Yeah. Uh, so the uh, look, I know from from all uh, my friend Mila, she writes a story about how, how they escaped, and this is a book. She, she died. My, she was a very very close friend of mine. Her husband, I'm still in touch with. Wait, no, not that one. This, she was Rue's age and she wrote a book about this case. It's a good story about Danish Jewish girl during World War II. And can I ask even the story about the king of Denmark? Mm, he's, there was talk of the Yellow Star and he said, he said, if my, um, Una said, oh, if the citizens of my country are made to wear the yellow star, I'll be the first one to wear it. So nobody ever wore it. And that's a true story? Yeah, that's true. The, the, the story was that he wore it, but nobody ever wore it because he was very resistant. We lived in the street that led up to his, uh, where he lived. Um, and as a child, we saw him riding, we saw the king riding past unaccompanied, nothing, uh, on his horse every day. I saw him, I was, he died in 47, I was six. And we, we also had the, uh, like changing of the guards coming past, gorgeous. I still love it to this day, the whole thing. And we had a maid uh, who looked after my younger brother and myself and uh, we, she used to take us for a walk and then we came back and then we had, we had lunch and if we hadn't finished our lunch by 12 o'clock when the changing of the guards came we had to go under the table we weren't allowed to look out of the window and her boyfriend was one of the guards have you do you know what it, the guards yeah. look like yeah. I've got a book about That's it you know so, so and uh, my brother and I, we were used to be taken for a walk to Lange Linie along the, along the, uh, where we lived was a minute from the harbour, along the harbour. So no, that's, that's a different, that's in the countryside. But this is a picture after the war? Yeah, this is, uh, Rouge must be about 12, which means that I'm seven, no, I think I'm nine and she's 14 and he's seven. And your brother's name? What? Your brother's name? Sorry? His my name? brother's name, Dodo. Yeah. And we call him Dodo. And, and that's my mother. And Eva, can I just ask you, what is your first recollection? Sorry? What is your very first recollection? It's from Sweden. Is it, and what do you remember? Well, I can only tell you, in uh, 65, I went to Sweden to visit my brother who was living there. And I also went to the National Museum. And I went, wanted to see where my father had worked. And I came into this room, and it had curtains like that, and everything was very bright. And I, and the room was maybe the size of this room here. Uh, and I said to them, but I remember this room, but it had long, dark velvet curtains. She said, yeah, that's how it was in 45. Uh, or, you know, and uh, that's how it used to be. So we left, we left when I was, uh, four. No, I was I was three and a bit. We left, but I remembered this room, except for it had shrunk. It was an ordinary big room, but it used to be a huge hall where I used to run from one side to the other. So that's one thing I remember. Then 
I also remember in the winter rolling down snow hills, so then I will have been three and a half. My first memories are from Sweden, and then tragedy. I remember we, we were given a bit of money, I don't know by whom, just before we left to go to Copenhagen. And Ruth, my sister, was sent across to the uh, big department store uh, uh, to buy a little present for me and for her. And I chose a beautiful little doll with a porcelain face and eyes that opened and closed. And we came back, I was told, I, I, I must not have had any toys as a you know, refugee child, there was no money for toys. So I remember myself putting it down, I couldn't reach the bell without sort of crawling up the wall, so I put it down on the floor to, in order to lever myself up to ring the bell, and my mother opened the door and took a step and stepped on the doll's face and it broke. That was really one of the worst things that happened for me. And, 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 and my, my sister was sent over to buy me a different doll and she came back with a horrible cloth doll, sort of uh, with a horrible cloth face. And this, this be I still see this beautiful doll. <laughs> anyway, but if that is the worst memory mm -hmm. you have, of a tragedy in your childhood, you're doing okay. And you remember coming back to, to Denmark? I remember the soldiers on... I don't remember coming into the flat, but I remember the soldiers being taken away on... on uh, in green, the, the German soldiers being taken away on, on lorries. That, uh, it was just after the war, so... I remember their pale faces on, on lorries, yeah. Uh, but okay, listen, we had a fabulous escape and and as I said, my parents were totally uh, stoic about all the things that befell them. They grew up in Victorian times and ended up in promiscuous Denmark and moved with the times extremely well adapted to things uh, and it always I always thought of my parents like uh, they said about during the uh, <coughs> the war the ordinary soldiers who were taken to be prisoners of wars complained like crazy but the officers who were taken to uh, uh, prisoners uh, to be prisoners of war, they said, not much worse than boarding school, <laughs> you know, public schools. <laughs> so I, I, I thought, because there is something. My parents, I mentioned before that I always made fun of them and said, you've got Frankfurter Hochmut, which means a feeling of superiority, which accompanies you through all your life. If you're used to feeling superior when you're young, it stays with you even when you haven't got two pennies to rub together. And I think my parents had this feeling of, uh, totally misguided in a way, but feeling of, sie waren bessere Leute, they were sort of people of a certain standing, and that accompanied me with them, it accompanied them, and in a way, it, it transferred itself to, I can only say for myself, because when I grew up, there was no money around, in my in my home, and I got a pair of corduroy trousers when I was about nine, which I absolutely loved, uh, brown corduroy, and in, eventually they got so worn that I had to have them patched on the backside. I, I think I mentioned that in the film, 
and uh, a friend of mine, I went to a very ordinary, uh, later on I went to a supposed to be very good uh, uh, grammar school, but I, 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 I went to a very ordinary school um, in Copenhagen and uh, I'm, one day I met uh, a friend of mine from my class and many of the kids in my class were had parents who were either divorced or had never married it was not exactly high class uh, most most of the kids and i saw this mother and i knew where she lived and a toilet in the courtyard and only a kitchen sink not a bathroom and she, um, this friend of mine had obviously said eva lives in a in a flat and they've got a proper bathroom it was it was not necessarily the the case for everybody in I'm talking about 48 um, and I saw this woman looking me up and down with my patch on my trousers and I remember saying silly cow <laughs> you know I had no I had no feelings of inferiority although the fact was uh, uh, my father was a Kamtan and uh, I had one pair of shoes and if I grew out of them it was tragedy I needed a new pair of shoes you know so uh, uh, we had the most crazy uh, to me it was absolute madness we had maids and when we had uh, people for dinner it was with sherry with the soup and white wine with the fish and red wine with the uh, meat course and con you know and and maids who were brought in with in black with little lace with aprons and lace uh, thing. and i thought this is crazy we what do we need to be so pretend to be so elegant my parents came from an elegant lifestyle and they they had to find a middle way between fitting in with the Joneses and 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 the actual fact, which was that there was very little cash money around, and to me, it was absolute madness. And we had a lot of help in the house, which is why both my sister and I, to this day, do not like having help in the house uh, as it so happened there but my, I have a help and uh, in the last months she's come in once for three hours and once for four hours you know which is nothing in this flat but okay we were away for Pesa but to this day I hate having help and I dread my kids are berating me mommy you're crazy uh, 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 but I need my privacy and to me, I'm still scarred by the amount of help we had as children at home. Did your father manage to find work? Sorry? After the war, when he came back to Denmark, did your father find work? Yeah, yeah, he worked and he was successful. But I think he was... Uh, he had five children. Uh, my parents had five children. They would have liked more, actually, but uh, between the war and all that, uh, that was not bad to, to have five children and we we he was he thought it's well worthwhile investing in in art but normal living expenses is a waste of time and he was very modest he had a gray suit and always spotlessly clean he has a picture, I think, your father and your mother later on. Yeah, yeah, he always wore a grey suit. And uh, this is another picture. Yeah. I think when they... He wore a grey suit until he was well in his 80s. He didn't possess an overcoat. The winters were harsh in Denmark and he, he would go out without a winter coat. Uh, just with like dressed like that that was how he was dressed where's the picture of him on the beach 
Yes, which so that, that which we which are keeping well away. Yeah. yeah. That's how he was dressed on the yeah. concession to the beach was the straw hat. Wow. Always dressed like that. Summer, winter, always dressed the same. He must have had fantastic circulation. It could be t 10 minus uh, Celsius and he would go out without a coat. And finally, my brother took him to the best shop in, 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 in Copenhagen and he was quite old by then. And my father said to the sales assistant, this coat, um, how does it wear? And the man looked at my father and said, depends for how long you want to have it. <laughs> you know? and, and, and I'll, I'll tell you about my dad. He, he was walking around in Copenhagen and a man comes out of a house in Copenhagen and he says, oh, Mr. Beer, are you still alive? And my father came back to tickle pink about this guy saying that. So, okay, anything else about so my pen? Oh, a this is a picture. Yeah, this, this is the door, this is the picture I showed you. This is the, the girl who went to the consul. It's a, a cousin of mine from America. It was taken, I think, from my parents. Could have been there. Is, it, is, this, is this in Copenhagen, this picture? Sorry? Was this picture taken in Denmark? Yeah, in out in the country, in Hornbeck. And your, pe your think, parents are in the middle? Yeah. And you standing, was above, you standing above your father? Sorry? You in the That's middle? Yeah. Wait, where's... I can't... I'm not like the... Tim and my father. There's... I can't see upside down. Ah, my mother's here. It's basically my siblings with their spouses, an aunt, an aunt from uh, an aunt on my, uh, an aunt and a cousin. And this is just another very joyful picture. Well, that's a picture from Simon, who is my second. It's a picture from Simon's uh, Bar Mitzvah, which was in 1984. <coughs> it's wonderful. And I think this is... A, that's the same. An amazing the whole family. That was the only time we were all together in, in Manchester, of all places. It's such a wonderful picture. And Eva, can I ask you on a... Sorry? Can I ask you on let a... Let me just ask you, let me just tell you. You don't need to put it on, you can... This, this one, she's a niece of mine. I spoke to her yesterday. She is a v highly successful film director. She got Oscar, I spoke to her for 22 minutes last night. Uh, she got Oscar, Emmy, every, every prize you can think of. What was the film? Uh, Oscar, she, she... She got an Oscar for a film, yeah. What was the film she did? Um, it... She produced? Now, let me just think. Uh, she, she had one that was amongst the last five, but a very wonderful German film got it that year. Um, look it up. She's called Susanne Beer. Wow. And, and, oh, her mother told me very proudly, she, very soon she's got to go and meet the Pope. The Pope of all people have invited a hundred people out of whom 20 are specially selected to have a more private audience with him and she's one of them. It's wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> the Pope. But she, she is a, she's a very gifted girl. She really is. And Eva, can I ask from Sorry? Your, from your family? Look, uh, um, yeah. Can I ask when you came back to Denmark? Yeah. From when did you first hear what happened to the family from? What happened to the family that 
were there any relatives that remained in Germany that didn't manage well, to? Well, yes, my I showed you the picture um, with the f yeah. siblings. Where well, it may be, oh, it's this one. Um, there was a brother in my mother. This is the youngest of the family. There was a brother in between those two called Julius, and he got killed in Theresienstadt, in, in Auschwitz, sorry. And my mother's older sister died after having been in Gours, uh, which was a camp in, in, in the south of France. She got in Petaiko there, and she, she didn't die in the camp, but she died from 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 the treatment she had in the camp. And when did your parents hear about it? Was it only after, so when did they get to know the news? My mother was devastated about her, her brother. He was her favorite sibling and apparently she got to know that he had been, we have still now uh, postcards that he's, my, my he was, my parents sent him uh, parcels in Auschwitz and we've got postcards of him acknowledging them. Uh, but he was presumably cast in 44 uh, and my mother was devastated about, not so much about the sister but about the brother. My father, all my father's siblings survived. Um, this I showed you. <laughs> this is an uncle of his and that's an aunt. Uh, they were married and he died in Theresienstadt. He had uh, uh, diabetes and died 42 shortly after having been taken from Germany and she survived till 44 and died in Auschwitz. And uh, my cousin who, who did this big book about the Beer family, uh, well, yeah that one, she's got lists and lists of uh, beers who, who died. It's all in here. Uh, loads, loads of people died of of the beer family. Okay, I, I I don't want to waste your time finding it, but she the whole chapter of this book is about the, the, the people who, who died, who passed through, perished, who died. Yeah, but she she traced back our family. Uh, let me just see where. She traced it back. Certainly, 17th century, also much be no, before. 60 here, died. Six, she traced it back. 1630. These are all. Uh, here you see. Ben Jose Rofe, uh, that is the acronym of beer, B I E R. Ben Jose Rofe, and he he died in 1630. In 1630, wow. Yeah, yeah, she she did a, like a fantastic. That's where my name comes from. She did a fantastic. Uh, this this book, absence and loss. Sorry, yeah. This book by Marion Davies. Yeah, but l let me just show you what she says in the beginning. Oh, is it here or is... No. No, sorry, one second. It would be in this book. Once she she did it in twenty three. It's a newly published. If you just <laughs> it, 
she she's called Marion Davis, but she said her maiden name is Marion Beer, and she was sorry she took the name Davis in a way because she wanted to uh, for the name Beer to. This is what she says there. Can you see it? Could you read it? Uh, so I was born Marion Beer shortly after the end of uh, World War Two. A few years after our marriage, I took my husband Jonathan's name and became Marion Davis. In some way, I regret this, as my identity lies very firmly with my family's long sojourn in the German-speaking lands, and this connection, at least as far as my surname is concerned, is now lost. The work is a chance to rectify this. Certainly, as a direct link between those who came as refugees from Germany in the 1930s and my descendants, I have a special position and interest in telling this story. So... That's wonderful. And, okay, um, oh, as this volume finishes with Maximilian and Auguste Hess, these are her, her great-grandparents, uh, my age. I have a, I'm, I was born into a religious family. I was determined to marry a religious man. I did. And uh, Baruch Hashem, uh, I can be very happy with my family who have more or less, uh, a bit more religious, a bit less, but basically all on the same page. But I used to hear this story which, cracked me up about my great-grandmother who had eight sons or eight beer sons standing in the sort of the, like a in Germany you often have had a, a window that was round where people could look this way that way and they and she would stand there and say I'll say it in German first. Jetzt guckt euch doch an, wer da zu Minche rennt. Nicht ein vernünftiger Mensch. Now, see who's running off to Minche. Minche. Not one sensible person. So, oh, she was she was very from, and uh, she had all these kids, uh, but she had this sarcastic uh, uh, view on it, you know, uh, on not being fanatic and so on. And I think so I found out only very, very recently that her, that I must have been called after her, my name is Eva, and she was called Chava, so it's on her gravestone. And the, the gravestone says what a firm woman she was, etc., etc. But uh, I think I must have inherited this slightly sarcastic view of religion. I, when I was 16, I said to my mother, I want to marry somebody who is religious, but not fechniot, you know, not uh, intolerant. And I want to marry somebody who's got a good sense of humor, but who is a really serious person. It said all kinds of marry somebody, uh, all kinds of things. And my mother said to me, Maldian, paint him. Such somebody like that doesn't exist. And as it so happened, all the things I asked for when I was 16, I got, plus a lot of things I didn't want. <laughs> but, but the essential things I was looking for in a husband, I got, and I'm very grateful about that. So, I wanted to, I don't know where my phone is, I must be here in the Balagans. Ah, yeah. I wanted to give you the link, I think. Can I just ask you, uh, Eva, as a big favor, um, you've seen so much and you've gone through so much, but what message do you give to your children and grandchildren? What? What message do you impart? I think you should watch the film. I think you should watch the film where all my grandchildren appear and I don't think, I don't make, how shall I say, I don't like to push 
I don't like to push anything. I don't believe in pushing things. Or forcing. What? Forcing, you don't want to... Yeah, I don't believe in pushing things very much. I believe in... I'm not particularly capable of being any other but, but myself. I, I'm just not capable of it. So, the message, I would say, uh, for me, a, a big thing in life is what Shakespeare says, I think, in Hamlet, but this above all else, be true to yourself, be, yeah, and that's what I feel is important. Uh, I, want, I wanted to say something to you about my personal thing. I've got a granddaughter who was taken by my daughter to the Kotel, and uh, she was four years old, and she kissed the Kotel, and then Daniela, my daughter, said to her, don't you want to say something, pray or something? She said, Davering is for boys. <laughs> and it's so cute. <laughs> and between my great-grandmother and my granddaughter, I'm somewhere there in between. Although I like to do things. Even you are exceptionally special. Sorry? You are such an amazing, special, very unique and very unbelievable person. An inspiration to all of us. And I want to thank you so much, Eva. This has been, you know, I had the great privilege to meet Ruth yeah. in London. And here in this book, Absence and Loss, yeah. is a picture of your dear sister. And yeah, I was very Ruth. fortunate to meet yeah. her husband. Yeah. And in this book, uh, which was written by Marion Davies, who's yeah. uh, a, she, a relative. She's a, very, she's a very gifted photographer. So she puts, this was, I think, in 2007, she says, there are now 55 living descendants many more now. Yeah, many more. of the Beer family. It's wonderful. And and many, many. Ruth is 88 by now. Wow. She was 70 there. She's 88 and she, there are far more. I mean, it's I, wonderful. Uh, even in that time, I've had, I don't know how many grandchildren after it's that. It's wonderful. But Eva, I just want to tell you, I am extremely grateful to you. This has been the most remarkable time spent and you are so such an inspiration to all of us you're you have such a wonderful outlook on life and you're so positive but you don't know me no but you're so positive and just allowing me to come into your home and for you to share your experiences it's been such an honor and a privilege really and i'm extremely grateful I'm you should just have Mazel Brocha at Mavis Room till 120 in really good health and just nachas from your family. And I, I have you, a lot of that. And I, you know, you, from looking but, at your but, parents, you, sorry? you had a most remarkable family and your parents were amazing. That My uh, parents were great fun, yeah. For them. And I, I, could, uh, I, I could tell you so many. F in fact, I mean, a few people have said to me, why don't you write? Uh, Event. And I am slightly temp. Uh, I uh, I'm a very private person, kind of thing. I I hate making speeches, and I hate any form of publicity. And in fact, Michael, my husband, died uh, tomorrow, three months ago, and there were no hespatim at all at his levi, and that is actually. <laughs> says she boastfully, that's me, because I went to a funeral where we stood for hours hearing Rabonim yowling, and I came back and I said to Michael, you know, when I go, I don't want a word of a husband, I don't want anything. And he said, we, we were very much on the wavelengths, and he said to me, that's, that's a good idea. I said, if I haven't managed to make an impression on people yeah. whilst I'm alive, I'm not going to have anybody uh, giving other people very constraints standing there. Uh, you know, wow. I don't want it. And he said not, and he didn't have it either. And I say I'm a very, I, I'm really that way, not interested. Anybody who came here to the shiver with a face like that, I said, we don't do that. You know. I, 
You really? celebrate life. You, huh? you celebrate life. You celebrate memories and yeah, life. Yeah, yeah, and look, privately, of course, I keep saying, we'll do, well, no, I'll do. You know, that's normal. But uh, uh, <coughs> how shall I say, I'm, I'm super grateful, but I don't like anything public, but I do think that my parents said so many hilarious things, and you know, I'll give you, my mother liked oats, so she offered, at the breakfast table, she offered oats to my, my father, and my father looked at her and said, there should be a difference between the, the kutcher, between the uh, horse driver and the horse, you know, that typical yeah, thing. Yeah, the wonderful sense of humor. Well, yeah, fantastic. Also that he said that, I'll die from a misprint. Sorry, yeah. The misprint. And, it's, it's and in our family, the worst thing you could do was to lick the knife. That was just a crime. So my father got on my mother's nerves something terrible. So she took a serrated grapefruit knife and went to <laughs> like that. And he said, mm, are you sharpening the knife? <laughs> <laughs> that kind of, I've got so many of those uh -huh. things. You know, they, they were... And my mother was, she said about my father, he's a bachelor with a wife and five children, that was one. And then she said about him and Mary's father, uh, the younger brother, Herbert and Irish are both aristocratic, but Herbert is a gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> So she, she wasn't lost either, you know, so I think, I think they were really an inspiration to so me, a, a big inspiration. But even you, you know, you, you, men, you didn't mention it publicly, but you, you actually... Sorry? You volunteered for the Hebra Kedisha for 20 I, years. Uh, sorry, I... You worked for the Hebra Kedisha for 20 years. Yeah, maybe 18. Which is, uh, which is a a, time, an incredible, yeah. and to... To do the profession that you did, a marriage counsellor is one of the hardest, possibly no, the hardest. I said, I said, I was used to it from home. <laughs> no, and I honestly, I do, I do think I'm blessed with certain things. I'm blessed with a sense of humour, and I'm blessed with being positive. And I think those two things help me to deal with, to to help clients to not to feel so burdened by their grief. You know, that, that one of my clients said to me, I went to this woman and she made everything look so terrible, but when I come to you, I feel I can cope, you know. It's uh, wonderful. No, you know, I, I did it. I would go, I had four, relatively young kids and a very busy household and very busy with all kinds of things and I would go exhausted to work uh, in the evening usually um, I also did morning session also evening but and I would come home refreshed because I loved working with people it's wonderful no I mean yeah. it, to me I always said I need my clients much more than they need me Gee. no really because I, I grew up, when I was young, I thought all I want to do is get married and have children. It took longer than I wanted till I found somebody to marry, but then Baruch Hashem took me half an hour to, it wasn't a shirach, it took me half an hour to say to somebody, I met my husband, but uh, uh, anyway, and uh, so so that was absolutely marvelous but I think I was very lucky that I uh, somebody who was still around rang me up one day and said the marriage council from London are coming up to Manchester I think you might be interested and I was so lucky that I who thought all I wanted to do was marry and have children by the time I had three children which happened in less than three years because we were desperate to get on with it. I said to Michael, what shall I do when the kids grow up? And he said to me, 
I don't understand you. You haven't been able to go to the dentist. You haven't had your hair cut. You've no time for anything and you're worrying. I said, yeah, I worry now because I don't want to become a cabbage like all the women I saw around me. Honestly, oh, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, you succeeded and you've been, you are inspiration and you must continue. And you, you, the positivity that you, you, that you possess, it, it's, it's infectious, it's wonderful. It really is. Yeah, I think you have to check with my kids how they feel. <laughs> no, listen, I have a very nice family. I That's really wonderful. do. Wonderful. And I'm very grateful. And I'll find that link. Wait. Eva, thank you so much. I'm so grateful to you. Ach, no.